This is Andy Schumann, and welcome to our webinar. The webinar will discuss how telehealth can be improved during the COVID-19 pandemic by utilizing the Doximity Dialer video application to facilitate virtual visits. I am a clinical assistant professor of pediatrics at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth, as well as the practice improvement section editor for contemporary pediatrics. In addition, I am CEO of metgizmos.com, a medical technology review site. Doximity has sponsored this webinar and is a sponsor of metgizmos.com. The objectives of this webinar are several. We will describe digital healthcare, telehealth, and telemedicine and discuss the overlap between all of these. We will detail the history of telehealth and describe the different kinds of telehealth visits. We will discuss the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the adoption of telehealth services, as well as detail the logistics and regulations for providing virtual visits. We will describe the roadblocks to effective video visits, as well as discuss how the Doximity Dialer video application can facilitate virtual visits in the medical office environment. There have been wonderful innovations in medical technology over the last 10 to 15 years. We now consider digital health care as the use of information technology and electronic communication tools and processes to deliver the best health care services possible. Telemedicine and telehealth are considered subsets of digital health care. Telemedicine is the provision of remote health care using telecommunication technologies. You can think of telemedicine as the services provided to a patient with a possible stroke that is in a emergency room who is being evaluated remotely by a teleneurologist to determine if anticoagulation therapy is indicated. Telehealth is a broader category of healthcare delivery that now includes mobile applications, call centers, as well as virtual medical visits, as well as remote diagnostic services and therapy services. Keep in mind that there is a broad overlap between these two. The American Telemedicine Association, in fact, indicates that these two terms are often used interchangeably. Telehealth has been with us for quite some time. A excellent example of how telehealth can be successful is the Healthy Access Project that was a well-funded research project that began in 2001 in the Rochester, New York area. It involved 22 schools and daycares the system connected pediatricians through remote workstations to trained telemedicine assistants to these remote locations. The assistants prepped the remote visits by recording vital signs, auscultated heart sounds, breath sounds, taking photos of children's rashes, throats, eardrums, and in some situations the assistants had the ability to perform rapid strep testing as well. Subsequently, the physician then had a face-to-face -face visit with the child, arrived at the diagnosis, and sent prescriptions to a pharmacy. And in many circumstances, the child even had an initial dose of an antibiotic administered by the assistant. Between 2001 and 2013, the Healthy Access project logged over 13,000 video visits. It demonstrated that remote telehealth services could accurately diagnose more than 85 percent of the conditions evaluated. It saved parents from missing significant time away from working by expediting care and it reduced emergency department visits by 22 percent. Over the past decade or so, a substantial number of medical centers have been extending their expertise to small community hospitals located in remote communities using expensive and sophisticated 
telemedicine technologies. Usually this involves positioning a video workstation at the remote location, linked to a remote diagnostic station manned by a nurse or medical assistant, such that a physician can interview a patient and perform a thorough exam remotely. The assistant located at the site of the patient records the vital signs, examines the ears with a video otoscope, and examines the heart and lungs via a electronic stethoscope. A high definition video camera is used to examine the eyes, look in the mouth and throat, and examine suspect skin lesion. EKGs can also be performed and shared, and imaging studies can be reviewed as well. In other situations, the diagnostic workstation is mobile and enables specialists to examine patients in ICUs or to make recommendations regarding care. As of 2017, 76% of hospitals have been implementing telehealth services. Over the past decade or so, telehealth services have transitioned from the hospital environment to the medical office environment. Telehealth now involves store and forward services, which are also called asynchronous encounters, where a patient may email a digital photo of a rash to you for an evaluation. You may in turn forward this photo to a dermatologist for recommendations regarding care. Telehealth also involves home monitoring of a patient's vital signs recorded on a smart device. By doing this, you expedite and improve care for those recently discharged from a hospital or who have a chronic illness. This has been demonstrated to improve the quality of care while saving money and reducing readmissions. Today, many physicians are using virtual visits to provide care where a patient is at home no longer needing to travel to the office and the physician may either be at the office or at home. There are many common uses for telehealth including monitoring patients who are on treatment protocols, who need close follow-up, care for chronic and complex conditions, post-operative wound care, group education consults with diabetic patients regarding management of their diabetes, eating habits, etc. In the behavioral health environment, you can provide mental health services remotely to patients where such services are in short supply. You can perform routine follow-up for anxiety, depression, and ADHD remotely. This enables you to adjust medications as appropriate. And you can also provide therapy sessions remotely as well. There are existing transportation issues and work-related issues for many patients that make it difficult for them to visit their physician. By using telehealth services, patients can access care from their home or work environment. Patients with mobility barriers can seek advice from their primary care physician. Patients can be evaluated urgently for patients with new onset of problems. These commonly include rashes, conjunctivitis, respiratory infections, suspected urinary tract infections, and many others. One can provide services for patients who are traveling or are temporarily located at a distance from their primary care provider. One can do pre-op counseling in a much more effective way than one can over the telephone. So given the many advantages of telehealth, how many providers are using telehealth applications and what has been the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the adoption of telehealth services? The American Medical Association published an AMA digital health research study in February of 2020 that compared telehealth adoption rates from 20 
2016 to 2019. They interviewed approximately 1,300 physicians in both years, including PCPs and specialists, and found that the use of virtual visits doubled from 14% in 2016 to 28% in 2019. Post-pandemic, Merritt Hawkins performed a survey of 842 physicians nationwide and found that 48% of physicians surveyed were treating patients via telemedicine, up from 18% from a previous survey performed in 2018. Many physicians suffered either a furlough or pay cut as a consequence of the pandemic, and a third of survey physicians were feeling great stress but continue to see patients. In June of this year, locumtenens.com surveyed 940 healthcare providers. They found that 74% of those surveyed indicated that they increased telehealth services during the pandemic. Many specialists also indicated increased use of telehealth services during the pandemic. Lastly, on September 16th of this year, Doximity released their State of Telemedicine report which examined patient perspectives and physician adoption of telemedicine since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. The study indicated that approximately 20% of medical visits will be telemedicine visits in 2020, and that the revenue generated by telemedicine visits will increase from approximately 29 billion this year to 106 billion by 2023. The study also indicated that patients preferred their cell phone to be used in virtual visits. Furthermore, the study indicated that utilization of virtual visits has increased dramatically among general patients and those with chronic illness. 53% of patients with chronic illnesses feel that virtual visits provide the same or better care compared to in-person visits compared to 23% of general patients. Additionally, the study showed that physicians age 40 and above were more likely to adopt telemedicine compared to younger physicians. So what are the nuts and bolts of performing a telehealth visit? You need to utilize a telehealth service provider, obtain what is called a business associates agreement with the company providing telehealth services. This is a document that assures that the company providing services is encrypting data and ensuring the integrity of the data and the privacy of the patient. When you conduct a visit, you need to assure that the visits are private and meet traditional HIPAA regulations. Most practices have a patient sign a telehealth permission form indicating that they understand that they will be billed for the service and their privacy will be assured. You need to assure that insurance companies will pay for services rendered by telehealth. When you initiate a visit, you need to confirm a patient's location. This is particularly important if the circumstances indicate that an ambulance needs to be summoned and sent to the patient's residence. As you would with a regular in-office visit, you need to document your visit, indicate that it is a telehealth encounter. You need to document the length of the encounter, as well as the location of the patient provider and in which state the patient was located. If you have any questions regarding telehealth policies in your state, you can get this information from the Center for Connected Health Policy. Prior to the pandemic, 32 states had mandates in place assuring insurance payments for telehealth virtual visits. Prior to the pandemic, many physicians were adopting telehealth services. And once the pandemic began, emergency authorizations at the federal and state level enabled telephone calls to substitute for virtual visits and for non-telehealth services like FaceTime and Google Duel to be used. Once the pandemic is resolved, these telehealth services will likely not be permitted. It would seem that virtual visits should be easy to implement, but there are many roadblocks to an effective virtual visit. Depending on the telehealth service provider, patients may often need to download software. Some telehealth service providers have complicated apps that are difficult to navigate. For practices, they may be expensive. 
In some situations, in order to launch a virtual visit, patients need to input complicated usernames and passwords. The quality of the visit is affected by the internet bandwidth, and in many situations, patients do not have anything more than just a cellular network. After doing many, many virtual visits over the course of many years, I've learned that too many patients are not tech savvy, do not read instructions, and this impacts on the ability of a patient to, to launch a virtual visit. And no matter how well the software is constructed, there are always tech glitches that may have to do with software or the hardware being used and many other extenuating circumstances. I've been doing telehealth for many years, but it was not until the pandemic hit that I learned how creative one can be in providing a wide variety of virtual visits for patients. You can, in fact, do well visits without an examination, vitals, and vaccines. You can do ill visits for rashes, conjunctivitis, medication adjustments, respiratory infections. In some instances, you have to use judgment in deciding whether an antibiotic or further testing is appropriate. I've used virtual visits over the course of years for managing children with mental health issues, such as depression, anxiety, and ADHD, and found it extremely effective. You can do virtual visits for hospitalization follow-ups, for wound checks, for follow-up visits, depending on need of the patient. There are many circumstances where you need to follow up a patient with a respiratory infection or a rash or gastroenteritis. So it is not unusual that I will schedule a follow-up telehealth visit in a few days just to monitor the response of a patient to therapy or to keep track of the course of an illness for the patient. Patients can receive services from other medical professionals, such as psychologists, speech therapists, and this is a wonderful way to deliver counseling for patients. In addition, when there's a question whether a patient needs to be seen in the office or a visit needs to be handled by telemedicine, or if the patient needs to be sent to an emergency room, a virtual visit is a quick and easy way to accomplish this. Doximity is the professional medical network for physicians. It's the largest community of healthcare professionals in the country with over 80% of US doctors and 45% of all nurse practitioners and physician assistants as verified members. Prior to the pandemic, the Doximity app integrated a dialer application which facilitated communication between physician and patient, it allowed you to mask your phone number and to connect with patients very quickly and easily. When the pandemic began, the engineers at Doximity quickly created a dialer video application, which it began to distribute for free to all providers and care team members. So far, 100,000 physicians across the United States have used the HIPAA-compliant Doximity dialer video application to care for patients during the COVID-19 pandemic. The Doximity dialer video application has many advantages over competing products. First and foremost, it's free, and it is also incredibly easy to use. One simply installs the Doximity application on your smartphone. You launch the application and then input the phone number of a patient and then click the video call button. The patient sees a video call invite within the message application on their smart device. They do nothing more than click on a link which initiates a video call within the browser on their smartphone. Recently, Doximity released the Doximity Dialer video application for use on tablets. This is very easy to use and has the same features 
that is built into the smartphone version. One of the best features of the application, which is currently in beta, is the call nudge feature. If a patient does not join the video visit, you can then launch phone call to the patient with a masked phone number to remind them that it's time for the visit and they need to join the visit merely by clicking on the link you sent them within their messenger app. There is now even a desktop version of the Doximity Dialer video application. This enables you to share your screen. My own preference is to use the iPad version so I can talk to the patient while I'm viewing their record on another computer. A terrific COVID-19 exclusive feature of the free Doximity video dialer app is that it enables physicians to create a healthcare team to allow office staff to conduct video visits with patients. This is a wonderful feature that enables your secretaries, nurses, medical assistants, and others to interact with patients directly in a HIPAA compliant video and it frees up physicians to accomplish tasks that don't directly require a physician's attention. There's a lot to like about the Doximity Dialer Video app. It's easy to use, it's free, it provides a business associates agreement so it can be used when the pandemic emergency is officially over. If you're using a smartphone or tablet or desktop, it masks the provider cell phone number. The nudge feature I find particularly useful because it enables the physician to help the patient establish the video connection. The support of a care team's model is terrific. It is seamless to use from both the provider and patient perspective. And right now, as mentioned previously, you can use it on your tablet, smartphone, as well as desktop. There are lots of training videos and discussions on the Doximity.com site. This concludes our webinar. For more information about the Doximity Dialer video app, please visit Doximity.com. And to view an interview with Doximity's Vice President of Product, Dr. Peter Alperin, please visit the MedGizmos website.